Welcome to this episode of Gone Medieval, I'm Matt Lewis. Chivalry is the famous backbone of the medieval knight and of medieval warfare, or at least that's what we're led to believe. James Titterton's new book, Deception in Medieval Warfare, tackles this question head on. What tricks did medieval generals have up their sleeve and how did they reconcile the use of deception with their chivalric principles? James is here to tell us more about the underhand tactics and the medieval view of them. Welcome to Gone Medieval, James. Thank you very much for having me, Matt. It's a pleasure. What kind of source material are you able to draw on to start with as you explore deception in medieval warfare? Are we looking at chronicles? Are we looking at romantic stories that give us a bit of an insight? Mostly what I'm looking at is chronicles. So these are narrative histories written down at the time, either by contemporaries or by people living slightly later and drawing on other accounts. Sometimes they're drawing on written accounts. Sometimes they're drawing on rumours that are circulating or eyewitnesses that may have been there so it's not quite what we would call objective historical reporting but it's the closest thing that we have in the middle ages but you mentioned romance and fiction and literature i do draw on some of that a little bit in the book because this is in some ways closer to what the fighting men of the period are reading and listening to Chronicles are written in Latin most of the time by clerics for other clerics. There are secular individuals who can read Latin, we know this, and it may be read to them. But if you want to know what the French-speaking aristocracy of Western Europe, which is the area I'm studying mostly, were interested in, what their culture was like, what their values were like, you want to go to the romances and to the chansons de geste, the great French epics. And we find in both of them lots and lots of trickery involved in warfare and i guess the fiction is a good indicator of what people are interested in what excites people what they want to know a bit more about so i guess that fictional side can tell us a bit more from that perspective maybe yes the middle ages is full of trickster characters and trickster stories we know absolutely that people were interested in these kind of stories so very famously you have robin hood Robin Hood is from slightly later than my period, but the figure of the outlaw trickster, the man who flees to the forest with a band of supporters and lives as an outlaw to fight injustice or his enemies, that figure appears already in the 12th and 13th centuries. So there's people like Heroard, your listeners might know him as Heroard the Wake, the Saxon leader who resisted the Normans in the Cambridge Fens. There's stories about him doing stuff that is very similar to Robin Hood. Fulk Fitzwarren, Eustace the Monk, these kind of characters of all the sort of proto-Robin Hood figures that appear in the 12th and 13th century. The story of Tristan and Isolde, which is a great love story in which the knight Tristan drinks a love potion and the lady Isolde, who's supposed to be married to the King of Cornwall, and they fall in love and they have this clandestine love affair that involves a lot of trickery. It's a burlesque and a comedy as well as a romance. And they have to do all sorts of things like they're in the same room and to get into the bed, Tristan like jumps between the two beds because they've put stuff on the floor so that it'll hear them. And it's all this sort of thing. It's quite knockabout. And my personal favourite of the trickster characters, I've sometimes seen him described as a 12th century Bugs Bunny. There's Reynard the Fox, who is part of this world of anthropomorphic animals the lion is the king his enemy is the wolf isengrin and this is the front cover of my book is reynard and isengrin fighting each other as knights but reynard is this completely amoral trickster character he will just deceive people for no particular reason and even when it doesn't benefit him particularly he just can't stop but there's all these very bawdy slapstick stories about him and he was clearly very popular and these were read started off in latin but we have english versions french versions dutch versions german versions there are references to reynard everywhere you find him in carvings in churches and in manuscript marginalia you'll find foxes taking geese or foxes dressed as bishops preaching to ducks and it's all these sort of satirical ideas and reynard is this sort of mimetic figure throughout the middle ages and he is a trickster so we can tell from all of this that trickery and cunning are something that is considered 
entertaining in the Middle Ages. Not necessarily the most admirable, maybe, but certainly entertaining and something that people want to hear about. I don't think I've ever heard Tristan and Isolt sound so much like a carry-on film, but (laughs) definitely make it sound more watchable. One other thing on the sources, as we get into this idea of trickery and military tactics in particular, do we need to be wary of whether we're hearing from the trick -er or the tricky? (laughs) if you like, the person on the receiving end or the person doing it, because presumably they have different views of whether trickery is a good thing. Yes, it depends very much, not so much actually on whether it's the tricker or the tricky, it's whether the person writing the story approves of the trickery. So, for example, a Norman chronicler will say, and then this happened and the French came in and they did this terrible thing and this terrible deception and they caused so much damage. And then the same incident may be described by the French chronicler going, oh, our king did this wonderfully clever thing and the perception is slightly changed. But sometimes you also get people writing from the perspective of the tricked and they will say this happened and they use it as a learning experience as a teaching experience because history in this period isn't just for entertainment or information it's didactic it's meant to teach you something reading history is meant to help you become a better person and one of the things that trickery teaches you is to be prudent prudence is a virtue wisdom is a virtue even the clerical writers are not naive about this they know that the world is full of people who will try and deceive you so for example the 12th century author gerald of wales tells a story about this particular english nobleman riding through the forests of wales and i'm not making this up pure monty python with a minstrel and a fiddler going before him singing through the woods and then the welsh rebels in the woods immediately immediately jump out and kill him and gerald says his counselors told him this was a bad idea and this goes to show you should always listen to good advice when you receive it so the moral of the story isn't look at these terrible welshmen it's look at this stupid englishman who should have been paying attention and should have been listening to good advice so it's not quite as straightforward as trickery is good if we do it and it's bad if they do it sometimes you can say there seems to be just an acceptance that okay it's going to happen you need to be clever about this you need to recognize that this is going to happen to you yeah and what can we learn from it and how can we be better prepared so it doesn't happen to us again yeah if you don't ever write about it you don't ever learn about it yes when you're researching the book did you find that there was much of a disconnect between the ideals of war and the reality of it so i think we often acquire this view of the chivalric middle ages in which knights were all honorable to each other and you know they fight stand up duels with each other and this kind of thing and that must be hard to reconcile with the idea that there are deceptive tactics going on as well did you find that there was a disconnect between the way that people thought war ought in an ideal world to be prosecuted and how it actually was Not as much as I expected when I started the project. When I started the project, I was expecting to find a lot of chroniclers and poets criticising trickery or going around the houses to justify it. But actually, what I found mostly was that there seems to be an acceptance that this was happening and this was going to happen. The important thing for most writers seems to be that once you have clearly stated that there is a war going on between two noblemen, two kingdoms, whatever... Whatever you do after that point is fair game, within reason. So if you go to sleep overnight in camp and don't watch out and don't put up guards and I come along and you're asleep and I capture you or kill you while you're in your sleep, that seems to be fair game. It's your fault. You knew I was out for you. It's when it becomes more, you didn't tell me we were having a war, you didn't tell me this was the state, the accusations go around to things like assassination and murder, and it's shifted from one moral category to another. A comparison you might make today is, say, the difference between murder, terrorism, and collateral damage. We have very different categories in our society of what we consider to be legitimate and illegitimate violence. The same thing happens in the Middle Ages. But there is examples of great chivalric figures using these kind of tactics. Richard the Lionheart, William Marshall, William the Conqueror, these great warriors are depicted by authors who are sympathetic to them as employing these kind of tricks and being shown to be 
clever generals, prudent generals, even warfare where you might expect things to be more idealized, say in accounts of the Crusades, which are these unambiguously moral, righteous causes fighting against the heathen for the recovery of the Holy Land. Even then, trickery, when it is used in the service of God in these wars, can be admirable. It can be described as clever, as cunning, not underhanded or dishonourable. It's an interesting distinction. And I ask because I'm surprised that there isn't more of a disconnect between those two. So it's interesting. But I guess we should allow that these people existed in that world and were well aware of what was actually going on around them. Is it often important and maybe I'm thinking about clerical chroniclers more than anybody else, to try and find a precedent or a connection in either ancient history or some kind of biblical justification for what they see going on. Does that allow them to rationalise naughtiness? The Bible has examples of this. Joshua does this in the book of Judges. He pretends to run away to lure the men of Ai, Ai, his army pretends to run away and then an ambush party jumps out and takes the city while it's undefended and the israelites do it later in the book of judges where they do the same thing to the benjamites so there is a precedent there that you can look at it and go oh and joshua's a prophet joshua's the anointed of the lord so if he can do it in that context and in a righteous cause then that might be something we can use and i guess we see william the conqueror doing exactly that at hastings yeah and making an effort to present his assault on England as justified by God because Harold had made all these oaths on relics and things like that. So by making a kind of holy connection, he can almost justify it as, well, you know, Joshua did this in God's name, I'm doing this in God's name. Yeah, absolutely. Gideon does the same thing. He attacks the Midianites while they're asleep. It's a really multi-layered deception because Gideon and his men, he has a commando force with them with torches in pots and they surround the camp and smash the pots and start shouting and waving the torches and the Midianites think, oh goodness, there's thousands of them were surrounded and they all panic. And we see versions of that story being used throughout the Middle Ages different places different times people attacking by night i've not found an example where it's explicitly said and this is what gideon did therefore it was okay for us to do but considering that these are written mostly by clerical authors they would expect their audience to know and in the same way they're all latin scholars and they have all had a latin education and have learned to read latin from classical texts that have been preserved and the classical world again is perfectly fine the roman texts are perfectly fine with trickery in warfare as you might expect we don't necessarily think of the romans as particularly chivalrous in the same way we do stereotypically of the middle ages but the romans had lots of examples in their literature of this happening there was an author called from who wrote a book called the stratagemata it's a first century text which is nothing but a collection of these stories of different kinds of deception in fact i based my book the structure of it on the stratagemata because he divides it into types of deception and i did oh that's a good idea i'll do that and frontinus's book is often bound together in a manuscript with a work by vegetti the art of warfare in inverted commas de re militari which was seen in the middle ages by clerics at least as the definitive description of how you fight a war and frontinus was often bound together in manuscripts with this art of war so it's clear that there's a intellectual connection at least amongst the intelligentsia amongst the clergy between legitimate effective warfare and deceitful conduct in that and tricking and misdirecting your enemy and as you mentioned you break the book up into types of deception and one of the things you deal with is spies in the book yes presumably part of the problem with dealing with spies is that it can be quite hard to see at least if they're good at being spies so it makes them difficult to spot maybe but how do we see spies and how important were they in various situations there's a couple of issues as you say a good spy is one you can't see jo prestwich who wrote an article about this back in the 70s i think about the intelligence network of william the conqueror he said that what we have to remember is that often the chronicler summarize the whole work of this huge intelligence network that's clearly out there with just it was reported to the king. So he doesn't tell us how or why, because the chronicler probably doesn't know, but it's assumed that the king has people all over the place, not necessarily like we'd think of today as like MI6 or MI5, but he has people gathering information and passing information. There's a whole network of information about what is going on in his lands that is then fed back to him, and it was reported to the king. 
we occasionally get references to them explicit references although it is sometimes difficult to work out exactly what's going on because the word in latin and the word in old french which are the two main languages of the sources i use for spy is the same word as the word for scout so when you're looking at a count and it's very unhelpful they say things like and we sent out exploratores and they came back and told us about the dispositions of the enemy is that just scout and then what's the line because espy is the word in french but it's difficult and i discussed this in the book we have like a one or two examples of people who are very clearly either disguising themselves or pretending to be something they're not in order to gather this kind of information so for example we've got peter the deacon in 1068 the norman warlord robert giscard wants to conquer sicily as part of the great norman conquest of the southern italy and sicily by the normans and he wants to attack the city of palermo so he sends a man called peter the deacon to the city and it says peter the deacon could speak the saracen tongue so probably arabic but robert says to him don't let on that you can speak arabic don't let on you can do this so peter goes and pretends he can't speak so the saracens will all talk in front of him as if he can't understand them and then he comes back to robert and says oh no they're absolutely terrified of us the city's ripe for the picking the strength there the city is like a body without a soul is the description so this is one of the very rare examples we find of espionage being explicitly described in the chronicle and it it's described by a an Italian chronicler, a Martus of Monte Cassino, as a great piece of cunning is the translation that Robert uses to conquer Sicily. And does the acceptability of using spies ever depend on the circumstances? So in that circumstance where you're dealing with people they would consider Saracens rather than co-religionists, other Christians, was it more acceptable perhaps on crusade in the Holy Land than it was against fellow Christians in Europe? Or is there not really that distinction? It's very difficult because nobody seems to discuss it there's not much in the way of explicit discussion about the morality of doing this again i think it's more of a brute fact of warfare that an army needs this kind of information that people will be gathering this kind of information and that it's considered prudent and sensible it's more visible i think in the crusader sources because there you have a group of people who have been dislocated from their own place and their own culture and put in a new place and culture where they don't speak the language they don't know the terrain so in western europe for example you can talk to the local landowners you can talk to the local clergy you can go and round up a bunch of peasants and say to them where does that road go where's the ford that allows us to cross the river have you seen the enemy where are they and it's much more difficult in the near east and we occasionally get little bits of information about how this is being done richard the lionheart on his crusade there's a reference in one of the chronicles to bernard the king's spy the royal spy and it says he was a native of that country and spoke the saracen language as well as anybody there and we know how much he was paid he was paid a great deal the chronicle actually lists his fees so this is clearly a man of very specialist skills and the king is using him so there's an indication that they're aware obviously that they need this kind of local information and that they're bringing these people as translators and as spies I guess the Richard I and Saladin relationship is quite interesting from that point of view because you do see, even though they're at war, they're talking to each other an awful lot and sending envoys to each other and you do get a sense from some of the chronicles that this is always about testing the mood of the opposition camp. You know, It's just about getting through Saladin's door or Richard's door and finding out how scared or nervous or whatever else they are, but it's covered up as a kind of peaceful envoy to deliver presents and things like that. But I guess it sounds like they considered that good practice to gather as much information as you possibly could. It wasn't sneaky, it was just good practice. Yeah, and also so diplomacy is a very good cover for espionage because you have to go there and they're under a flag of truce so you can walk around and you can come back and you can also use that to your advantage so if you have an envoy coming into the camp you can send it around and say look at my vast army look at how strong the walls are you'll never get in here you'll never and then they go back and the idea is that they tell them which is what's happening with peter the deacon is that the emir of palermo thinks that he's put up a brave front and he doesn't realize that he hasn't have you got a couple of of examples of the kinds of tactics and deception that we can see in operation. I mean, you mentioned William Marshall before, so that rings bells. How on earth is he being sneaky? 
he is being sneaky and it seems to be these are some of his favorite stories that he liked to tell the history of william marshall that's put together by his family after he dies is obviously designed to celebrate him and make him look as good as possible and some of the stories that he includes are decidedly underhanded but again it's treated as a joke for example at tournaments it describes him as this great tournament which is mock warfare essentially in this period it's not individual jousting it's everybody gets together in two huge teams and fights over several miles of countryside and it's said that the count of flanders had a trick what's supposed to happen is that everybody gets in the field and then when someone blows the whistle everyone runs at each other and there's a big fight and it says that the count of flanders would just not join in and would just wait until everyone else was knackered then he and his men would ride in and capture everybody and win the tournament and william marshall goes that's a really good idea i'm going to do that and he tells the young king henry who he's mentoring as the older knight we should do this this is a really good tactic and this is presented as an entirely positive thing as a really good good sound way of behaving despite the fact that it is clearly against the spirit of what's supposed to be happening here but they're a lot more ruthless than you'd think and i guess you can pass that off as the prudence of learning lessons from other people you know if it works for the count of flanders we should do it too yeah we keep getting beaten up by this guy we should copy him but this extends not just in this sort of play world of the tournament this extends into the real world of warfare so in 1188 william has now moved on and is now in the household of king henry ii so the young henry's father and they are negotiating with philip augustus king of france and philip augustus has essentially thrown his toys out the pram and said i'm not going to negotiate with you it's war i mean it this time and the poem again describes this is the only source we have for this so this is obviously something that he was very proud of and the family were very proud of him even if he didn't really do it they wanted to say look what he did he goes to king henry and says my lord right pretend to disband the army if we send all of the army away the french will think we've given up and they'll go home and they'll disband their army but secretly we'll gather everyone back together in a week's time and then they'll be undefended and we can pillage and plunder all the lands around here and the king replies to marshall marshall you are courtly you've displayed courtesy you have been a good courtier to me and given me good advice because that's what the courtier is supposed to do again it's this idea of good advice of being a good vassal and they do that and then it describes with the kind of glee that you only get in sort of 13th century romances about all the horrible atrocities they commit to the local peasantry because these are aristocrats and they don't care but yeah the fact that's in the text i think is really significant because if it was considered morally dubious or dishonorable then there's no way that the family of william marshall would have let that get put in the text there's no way the poet who's being paid to make william marshall look like this great hero that he's got the reputation for would have put that in and we know from if you read david crouch's study of the text that the marshall poem very definitely edits out certain aspects of his career or de-emphasizes aspects of the career that weren't considered honorable or particularly glorious so the fact that they kept this stuff in tells us something about the culture tells us something about their mindset yeah it makes it even more interesting that it stayed there one of the other tactics that you talk about in the book is the fake corpse ruse so can you tell us a little bit about what that is and some examples of when it was used please this is a really interesting little story that has a very long shelf life so the first example i can find of it in a medieval text is in a norman chronicle dudo of san quentin writes a history of the norman dukes duke richard of normandy says i want you to write this history that gives the history of the norman people and my family and the idea is that it makes them look like legitimate part of the european aristocracy and at the start of the story is a story about this viking raider called hasting who is going on a pillaging expedition to italy and he gets to this city and he thinks it's rome it isn't and he can't work out how to get inside so he pretends that he wants to be baptized and priests come out of the city and they baptize him then he sends word a couple of days later that he's dying 
his men then pretend that he's dead and they say oh he's dead he's a christian can we bring him into your city to bury him and they put weapons inside the coffin inside the beer and they carry the dead body in and they have a funeral mass for him and he describes him jumping up in the middle of the funeral mass drawing his sword and killing the bishop saying the funeral mass it's this really over the top story and then they pillage the city and all of this and it's meant to show how wicked and awful the viking people were before the good duke Rollo appears the founder of the norman duke line and he's baptized for real and he cleanses the sin of the norman people for all of the things that are epitomized by hasting but what's interesting about this story on its own it's just really over the top story a villain origin story for the normans but it starts appearing in later chronicles as an example of cleverness of sneakiness of commendable trickery so robert guiscard again is described as doing something very similar to get into a town in italy in the 11th century he doesn't kill anybody doing it he pretends that one of his men has died and says we need to bring the body in and then they drop the coffin in the doorway of the town and they can't shut the door and the guys all jump and the normans all run in and take over the town but there's no blasphemy there's no bishop killing no rape and pillage and we get the same thing that his son, Roger II of Sicily, is alleged to have done this to get into Monte Cassino. And there's also a version of this story that gets circulated about Harold Hardrada, so from 1066 and all that, the Viking. The saga of his life has a version of this story that allegedly happens in Sicily while he was serving as a member of the Varangian Guard for the Byzantine Empire, because Harada was the king of Norway, was exiled and while in exile. And we know this is true. He went to fight for the Byzantine Empire. But this story gets attached to him. And again, it's the same basic trick, but all of the blasphemy has been removed. I doubt it ever really did happen. But that's not the most important or interesting thing I think about this story. It's the fact that it's been repeated in different contexts, attached to different individuals, and used as an example of the cleverness and the cunning of the normans or the norse or the vikings or whoever's doing it and that people obviously liked hearing that story and that tells you something about the culture that tells you something about the mindset of these people i was gonna say it's almost like it's a successful trope that people will buy it you know it appears in various guises in hollywood films today we can see the same themes and the same processes going on slightly altered so a thousand years ago people still liked those kind of tropes and they wanted to see them presented in a slightly different way as exciting stories once i started doing this project i couldn't watch a film i suddenly realized every film i watched every action film oh my goodness it's that trope from the medieval chronicles the cunning hero is still with us today in so many different forms there's a definite podcast in that we'll have to come back and tear some medieval films apart <laughs> <laughs> or not even medieval films i think it's just all sorts of films isn't it yeah I think more of this has been presented as acceptable and even laudable than I thought was going to be the case. Did you come across things that were absolutely off limits? Were there tactics that were considered beyond the pale? And even if they were, do we still see them used? The only thing that I found that seems to be universally considered regardless of context as bad in terms of deceitful tactics was if you make an oath to somebody and then you break it because as you mentioned the back and forth between say richard and saladin this is a thing throughout the middle ages in that it's very small scale warfare by the standards of what we later periods and it's very personal so sieges often are a constant back and forth not just of arrows and swords but of words of people People negotiating and often the accounts of battles for example will say and before the battle started both sides sent out envoys to try and resolve it peacefully and sometimes that works and sometimes that didn't sometimes the battle happens anyway and this could involve making promises and you would give your word and make an oath sometimes on holy artifacts you'd like to bring a bible or a relic and make an oath so for example to say i swear not to attack you tomorrow it is a feast day i will not attack you on the day of john the baptist for example and the idea is that once you've given that you've given your word in an honor-based culture that is extremely important so to break that is to break one of the fundamental 
social contracts that hold this society together because medieval society is held together by oaths you make an oath to your liege lord monks swear oaths to the abbot clergy swear oaths to the pope and kings swear oaths to uphold the laws of their kingdom and all the way down to basic business transactions is that it takes the form of an oath so to break that is to put yourself outside of the social norms and almost you declare yourself fair game for anything but people still do it because it's a really effective trick if you can pull it off because if the enemy's not expecting you to attack and you've said you will you could just defeat them without having to go through the whole process of a stand-up fight and we do find occasions where this happens and we have a glimpse not much but a glimpse of how they might have justified it so an example i use is from a chronicle by the name of galbert of bruges this is set in bruges in low countries and he tells the story of the murder of charles the good count of flanders charles the good is having a dispute with a local family called the erembalds and eventually it gets to the point where the erembalds murder him while he's at prayer in a church in bruges it's this utterly scandalous thing breaking so many taboos he's their liege lord it's in a church and then the erembolds flee to the castle that's in the center of bruges bruges like most medieval cities has a fortress that can be used for defense and they hold up in there and then those who support count charles who want to punish them come and lay siege to the castle and galbert is in the town at the time and it's almost a diary he's writing one of the things Galbert says is that the Count's treasure, the treasury of the county, is in the castle with the Erembalds. And he says that the besiegers are coming out, are standing outside and saying, OK, send out some of the money and we'll let you go and we'll be merciful. And so the Erembalds send out a bit of the money and they don't let them go. And then they do it again and they do it again. And Galbert says the besiegers justified this by saying they're oath breakers and an oath made to an oath breaker is not valid we don't have to do anything now galbert seems to think this is morally ambiguous galbert appears to be being ironic when he's talking about this but my theory is that maybe we're seeing just a little bit into the mindset of the people who do these kind of things is that if you can portray your enemy as so morally repugnant that they have put themselves outside the bounds of conventional morality then you can do anything you like to them we see this in the Battle of Evesham in the 13th century in England. Simon de Montfort and all of his followers are brutally murdered after the battle. They're defeated and then just hacked to bits, which is in direct contravention of chivalric convention. They're supposed to be, if they surrender, you're supposed to take them hostage. You're supposed to show mercy to a defeated enemy. But Simon de Montfort, by his actions, by seizing the king, seizing power, breaking this contract of how this kingdom is supposed to be governed has set himself outside of conventional morality and so the royalists go no this is it we're going to kill him so it's just about how you position your enemy i guess if we go back to hastings again as well william the conqueror is careful to position harold as someone who has broken an oath and therefore he is fair game and it's odd that we remember him as william the conqueror when what he would probably say was no i was just getting what was rightfully mine there was no conquest here harold was never really king because he was an oath breaker exactly yes william the just restorer doesn't have the same ring no no the conqueror is one of the great epithets to be given but i just wonder whether he would say oh i wasn't a conqueror no no that's not how it worked i thank you so much for joining us to share all of that james it's been absolutely fascinating insight into medieval mindset i think as much as military tactics it's about what people thought of it and how they rationalize these things and use these things it's been fascinating to talk about yeah whether these individual tactics were used exactly if we got in a time machine and went and stood at hastings and watched would we have seen these exact tactics happening i think is something we can't know because everything we know about military history and medieval military history in particular is filtered through all these sources but what we can know about and what we can study and for me what's more interesting is how did people think about this what was the culturally accepted way of doing this because we can get closer to that yeah and i guess we always have to be wary again you know with hastings if william's men did flee when he didn't want them to if you win the battle then you can kind of recast that as a clever military tactic anyway whether it's what really happened or not but as you say it's more about what people wanted you to know yes absolutely or wanted you to think about what's going on brilliant well, thank you so much james James's book, Deception in Medieval Warfare, is out now and is packed with examples, details and source material to explore this aspect of medieval warfare and mindset a little bit further. Music.
You can join Dr. Kat Jarman on Tuesday for another brand new episode. Don't forget to also subscribe or follow us wherever you get your podcasts from and to tell all your friends and family that you've gone medieval. If you get a moment, please do drop us a review or rate us anywhere that you get your podcasts, including Spotify. It really does help new listeners to find us. If you're enjoying this and looking for a bit more medieval goodness in your life, you can subscribe to our Medieval Mondays newsletter by following the links in the show notes below. Anyway, I'd better let you go. I've been Matt Lewis, and we've just gone medieval with History Hits. <laughs>